Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 11 starts now. An 87-year-old grandmother in a wheelchair trapped in a burning home. I was told it was a Mike and a Chris um, that pulled her out. Um, so we thank God for Mike and Chris. Tonight, we are meeting the two Southfield firefighters who didn't hesitate to save the day. And those firefighters knew something was wrong when they could see the smoke from the Southfield freeway. When they got to that home, they realized there was no time to waste. Mara McDonald live in Southfield at the fire station one uh, with more on how that 87 year old woman is doing tonight. Mara. Hi, Devin. Her name is Essie and she is making a remarkable recovery. She still has some lingering effects of smoke inhalation, but she may be released from the hospital tomorrow. And when you take a look at some of the interior photos of what this house looks like, you'll realize how lucky she is. The house is simply not livable after the blaze. When neighbors called 911, Southfield firefighters already coming back from another call headed to the scene. We can see a lot of smoke from Southfield Road. Neighbors were yelling there was a wheelchair bound 87 year old stuck inside. And that's when Chris made the decision that um, we're just going to go. We're going to mask up and and go in and get her. No hose line, no waiting for more trucks. We immediately got onto the ground, started crawling and searching the room. At the same time, Mike and Chris were crawling through a wall of smoke and flame. Barb Shaw was on her way home from work as a teacher at DPSCD. When I hit the service drive coming home, I saw the smoke billowing up in the air. Her heart dropped when she turned on her street and saw it was her home. She started running. She saw her nieces. I was like, OK, you're here. And I gave them a hug. I was like, now where's my mama? Her mother, Essie, was inside. Chris and Mike hunting for her. I think she might have heard us, but she started screaming. Um, that kind of helped us lead, lead us to her. They hauled her out. And I turned around and I saw her on the grass with four firefighters around her. Um, and I was told it was a Mike and a Chris um, that pulled her out. Um, so we thank God for Mike and Chris. Back here live. Thank God for Mike and Chris indeed. You know, Barb says that she's so grateful that everybody got out and that, you know, things are just things. They're replaceable. Until you come to find out there's an issue with her mortgage company where she was paying her homeowner's insurance through. Now it's questionable about whether her homeowners was actually paid up. So she's in the middle of trying to straighten that mess all out. Meanwhile, friends and colleagues at DPSCD have started to go fund me for the family. If you want more info on that, all you have to do is head on over to clickondetroit.com. And Kimberly Devon, I will tell you that Barb said she cannot believe how really wonderful her colleagues at Detroit Public Schools have been for her. We're live in Southfield tonight. I'm Mara McDonald. Local four. Which means she had a lot of people coming through. All right, Mara. A local mother suing the ma maker of a popular baby formula, claiming it made her baby sick before it was recalled some months later. Pamela Osborne is live at the 36th District Court in downtown Detroit, where that lawsuit was filed just hours ago. And Pam, you spoke with that mother. Kimberly, I did, and she tells me that she trusted the Similac brand that is until it made her baby sick. Baby Daxton made his way into the world on October 31st, 2021. Mom Wendy Jackson, a medical doctor herself, wanted to breastfeed, but she wasn't producing enough milk. She did what she thought was the next best thing. She turned to the Similac formula Oakwood Hospital provided her with. But I'm just upset that they... They gave that out and I trusted that brand. Almost immediately, she noticed something was off. My baby had a strange smell to him. He started having a, this thick uh, scaly scalp. The hair fell out in the middle. Um, he started getting on his cheek, side, his whole body, this thick plaques of skin. His pediatrician wasn't overly concerned, but Jackson, she was. Weeks later, she stopped using Similac altogether. And then the symptoms went away. The scaling stopped in a couple days. It was months later that Abbott Nutrition announced a recall on several types of its formula because of a dangerous bacteria. Two infants died. 
Several others were hospitalized, and even more moms, like Jackson, believe that formula made their babies sick, too. This is not the first time Abbott Labs has been in some type of difficulty. Attorney Dion Webster-Cox is filing suit against Abbott Labs, who she alleges endangered the lives of babies right here in Michigan. She's representing several local mothers, like Jackson. It's the same thing. They were at the hospital. They were given a seven-day supply. They, the child is having, is constipated. The child is developing a rash. The child has these, something on the scalp. Something is just not right. She says the refunds and replacements offered by Similac don't go far enough. What these moms worry about are the long-term impacts of exposure to the bacteria. Physical milestones can be different than educational milestones, mental milestones. We just don't know, and that is what is heartbreaking to me to not know. And so fortunately, her baby is doing well right now. But as you can imagine, there is concern for his future. As I mentioned in that piece there, that attorney talking to other mothers with similar con concerns here in Southeast Michigan. So this case in court may be the first of many reporting live tonight in downtown Detroit. I'm Pamela Osborne, Local 4. Yeah. We'll continue to follow whatever happens from it. Pamela, we appreciate it. Moments ago, parents and students finished giving feedback on plans to compensate families at Oxford High School impacted by the tragic shooting last November. They spoke at a town hall hosted by the National Compassion Fund, which is managing the nearly $2 million in funds donated. This event sought feedback on the proposal that limits payments to students who were in or near a hallway, a restroom, and one particular classroom where the shooting occurred. One student fought back tears remembering the events of the day. I'm sure that people who were on the other side of the school experienced trauma as well, but they were never really in danger because he never went on the other side of the school. And I'm sure that they were very scared, but they were never in danger in reality because he never went on the other side of the school. And it's really hurtful to hear people saying stuff like this because I ran for my life. Boy, the current proposal excludes hundreds of other students and staff members. Some parents argue excluding them re-traumatizes them. An 11-person committee made up of Oxford parents, business leaders, and mental health professionals are going to vote on the final version of the plan. Meanwhile, hours from now, the parents of the alleged Oxford school shooter will head back to court. James and Jennifer Crumbley are due for a pretrial hearing. According to the Free Press, the prosecution was warned the court was warned the court the couple may be using the same law firm to set themselves up for an appeal should they be convicted. To avoid this, the prosecution has asked the judge to intervene and reevaluate this arrangement. Tomorrow's hearing begins at 10 a.m. An investigation now underway to determine what caused a mobile home to catch fire, killing four people, all of whom were inside. This happened early this morning at the Victoria Meadows Mobile Home Park, not far from the town of Dryden's main intersection, which is Mill Road and Main Street. Video from neighbors show the home fully engulfed in fire. Investigators say when firefighters arrived, they didn't know if anyone was inside, but then later recovered four bodies. Neighbors said they heard a loud noise and then saw flames. It was a boom. It wasn't very loud, so I didn't think it was near the house. It sounded like a roll of thunder. And um, my husband said he could feel it in the floor of the house. The investigators have not yet identified the victims, at least not publicly. Neighbors say an elderly woman lived there with her granddaughter as well as the granddaughter's two teenage children. Right now, Detroit police are searching for a driver who ran over and killed a mother on Detroit's east side. Video from last night near Seven Mile and Hayes shows a car doing donuts around 40-year-old Tiffany Watson Vance. She was able to get her six-year-old son out of the way before he was run over. Get out the way, baby! Tonight, get police the way, say baby. the incident was intentional. We're told two groups of people gathered in the area to settle some kind of fight when that mother was hit. My mama was everything I had. My mama was the only thing, and now she go. Just hours ago, Detroit police released video of this person of interest. They say they're looking for a woman who is driving a gray or silver 2020 Nissan Murano. It has a Minnesota license plate. That plate number FBY246.
Ukraine refusing to surrender a key city to Vladimir Putin while Russian forces seem to be purposely targeting civilians. Russia demanded the surrender of the city of Mariupol, but Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky refused. Officials say about 90 percent of the city's buildings have been damaged or destroyed, but some 300,000 people remain trapped in the city. Russia is also still targeting the capital city of Kyiv, forcing a new 35-hour curfew going into effect there. Tonight, President Biden warns Russia is plotting to unleash a cyber attack on the U.S. The magnitude of Russia's cyber capacity is fairly consequential, and it's coming. The federal government is doing its part to get ready. President Biden will be traveling to Brussels and then Poland later this week to discuss additional sanctions against Russia and more humanitarian aid for Ukraine.